from the recorder right here, and we're starting right away. Good morning, Kahal Kadosh, Good morning. Good morning to everybody. Today, Tuesday, the 7th of Adar 1, corresponding to the 8th day of February. Today's class graciously is dedicated in honor of the wedding of Kevin Elias Gersuni to Mrs. Lital Gelman by his dear parents, Mario and Marcela Gersuni. May the couple have great beracha and aslaha. Amen. Amen. Additionally, today's class dedicated by Yaakov Kobe Cohen for the Refua Shelema of Dov Ben Tova. Additionally, today's class graciously dedicated by Mr. Shimon Buskila, the Ainu Nishmati's beloved father, Yosef Ben Frecha. Alava Shalom, and to this class also dedicated the Ayu Nishmat Meir Ben Shemuel, Meir Ben Shema, and Aliyah Haben Shema in Gan Eden. Amen. As I started to mention the day of today, it's important to clarify a halakhic question that comes up whenever we have a Shana Mi'obedet. Whenever we have a Jewish leap year like we have today. So, for practical halachic purposes, the Hilula of Moshe Rabbeinu that is attributed to the seventh day of Adar is commemorated on Adar second whenever we have a leap year. And the simple answer is due to the fact that when Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, the concept of a Jewish leap year was not part of halakha yet. So Moshe Rabbeinu for sure was niftar on a regular adar. And the halakha is that whenever somebody's passed away on a regular adar, the yortzai or the birthday or the bar mitzvah is commemorated on the adar number two. Needless to say that if somebody passed away, has the shalom on Adar 1, or Hamabdil was born on Adar 1. So whenever it comes to the Yor site in a leap year, or a Bar Mitzvah, you do it in Adar 1. But the true difference in the halakha will happen if, God forbid, someone lost a relative a year ago in the month of Adar. Which was not a leap year. When, when, which was not a leap year. When do you stop saying Kaddish? So you have Adar, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, Tishri, Heshvan, Kislev, Tevet, Shevat. So you finish Kaddish on the month of Shevat because you already are 12 months. Obviously, maybe it sounds a bit confusing. When do I do a dar one? When do I do a dar bed? Don't worry about it. If you have a questions of this magnitude or this, this nature, speak to me privately or contact your local rabbi. And I'm sure wherever you are, the rabbi will give you the proper halakha. But it was my obligation to start the class today because immediately, the moment you say the seventh of Adar, people are already connected to the Hilula of Moshe Rabbeinu. So someone asked before, so Rabbi, I lit last night a candle in memory of Moshe Rabbeinu, and I learned in memory of Moshe Rabbeinu, it didn't go, didn't do anything. I said, Hasbe Shalom. Of course it does. Let's clarify. It's not, it's not a, 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 a sin, God forbid to light a candle in honor of Moshe Rabbein. I personally light candles every week in memory of certain Satikim. And when it came certain Hilulot, and Moshe Shabbat, it's Rosh Chodesh, etc. So definitely it's not an Avon if you lit a candle in honor of Moshe Rabbeinu, and if you made the Tikkun in honor of Moshe Rabbeinu, but the real official version will be exactly a month from uh, today. Now, today we're going to talk about money. Money, money, money. Money <laughs> is a need. Today, you know, although money is having a retirement, cash is having a retirement, there are stores that don't accept cash. <laughs> True. Yeah. That's why we're going to make it unconstitutional soon. 
There is a county ordinance coming soon that stores cannot refuse cash unless it's an online store, etc. <coughs> but interesting, the Gemara writes that prior to Mashiach's arrival, cash will be leaving the world gradually. When you have no more cash, look in my packet. That's what I have. Plastic. Plastic. Recyclable. <laughs> I have cash only for sedaka. I don't have a, I don't have an ATM machine in the kupa. Coming soon. Coming soon. We're gonna put one probably. Okay? But the reality Yes, right, right, right. It, right, I know, but it didn't work. No, it didn't work. Uh, maybe today it will because now people are more like in tune into no cash, into more plastic, Zell, Venmo, all these different platforms that you can pay. You go to a restaurant with your friends and you split the bill. Okay. You pay, okay, your share was X, B, X, Y, Z, whatever, technology. But let's say that a person has a lot of money. And I'm not talking about cash, just in case. A person has a lot of wealth. How much sedaka can a person give? 20%. We'll see what the Gemara says. There are many answers. There are many answers to this question. Everybody knows the basic answer of the sedaka that comes in the Masechet Ketubot, and it says, Be'usha hitkino. The Sanhedrin made a takana. When it comes to giving charity, Ali Bazbez Yoter Mihomesh. It says, don't give more than 20% of your available liquid funding. Why? Because Hakamim fear that if the person will give more than 20%, maybe the person may find himself in a situation that he will need or she will need from others, so then the giving of the Siddhaka actually defeated the purpose of helping others. The Gemara reinforces that this is exactly the Takanat Hakamim in the time of Rebina. And it says the same thing. Uma ase behad shebikesh lebasbez yoter mihomesh. And there was a story that there was one fellow who wanted to give more than a fifth. Belo inihu lo habero. His habruta did not allow him to do so. Umanu, who is this fellow who didn't allow him? Rabbi Ishbab beamrele. So this decree by the Sanhedrin, it wasn't stamped a decree simply written, but it was with halachic precautions. Let's clarify the practical halachic parameters. One thing is the ma'aser that a person must give from the net income Ma'aser, minimum 10%, maximum 20%. When a person gives the minimum ma'aser, is fulfilling the halakha at a basic level. The ultimate level will be 20%. Homish. That's ma'aser. Sedaka is not different. Maximum allowance, 20%. Needless to say, let's say that a person makes a business, so to speak, or let's say the person makes it easier. The person hits the lottery, mm -hmm. right? And a person won $150 million. <laughs> say amen. Toda <laughs> amen. <laughs> I have to buy a ticket in order to win. So you buy it and I win. Okay. <laughs> now, after taxes, probably the person nets 60 million. 
Well, more than 50? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, okay, 75 million net take home. You have tax, you have taxes you gotta pay. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they, they tax it before you collect the price. Yeah, of course. You're paying the lump sum. 60%. Oh, 60%? Okay, somebody just told us 60%. Okay, so you have 50 million net. Okay? And in your life, you barely made, let's say, 200,000 a year, 300,000 a year, half a million a year. That's a nice income, right? I don't know many people that make that amount, by the way. Okay, remember that yourself is a mega amount. So imagine now, suddenly, you have 50 millions in your account. First rule, don't publicize it. Don't talk about it. Don't start wasting money and spending money like there is no tomorrow. Because you will become a target. You probably you will lose the money. And suddenly you're going to have people becoming your cousins, your distant relatives, your child, your parent, your brother, and a long lost relative. And we all know the statistic that tells us that a big chunk of individuals, right? that win the lottery, they either they are gone from the world, or they go, they go into debt, bankruptcy, addictions, drugs, alcoholism, divorce, and God forbid, even leaving the world prematurely. So you need to be super cautious. So are you gonna tell me that if a person wants to give, let's say, $50 million, 10% is five million, 20% is 10 million, are you going to tell him, don't give me more than 10 million? He can give more. He can give more. So what is the Gemara referring to? In a case of normalcy in the income. Let's say you made a deal. You bought an IPO. Right? You bought a, an IPO. You pay 0 0.00002. Shiva. Shiva. Should have the Hayat Ametim. <laughs> yesterday had the Hayat Ametim. It went up yesterday. I'm monitoring the case. I'm a customer of 70 million pieces. So I'll keep an eye on it. Okay? 70. Now suddenly imagine that this goes to one cent. That's a lot of guilt. So he cannot give 25%? Of course he can. <clears throat> Because this is a speculation. And I'm not telling you for the record to the virtual audience of Aitorah and to the audience here and whoever will be watching or listening this class later. I'm not telling you to go ahead and buy this type of a speculative type of a crypto or whatever you call it because I'm not an expert in this field. I am, I am, but not to give an advice to others. I can make a decision for my own mindset or my own understanding. But to tell you, go ahead and do it, I will never do that because I don't know enough. And I know people who made some money, but I know more people that lost a lot of money. Has shalom, just in this speculation. The Gemara goes further and it says, where do we learn? Yes, crypto, yeah. In the olden days, whenever you say the word crypto has something to do, cryptic message, kryptonite. and something kryptonite from Superman, <laughs> now it became part of the dictionary, of the vocabulary, right? But that was with a K, and this is with a C, I think. So difference in the spelling, right? But anyways, where does the Hachamim, or the Sanhedrin, or the Gemara learn that there is a concept of 20%? We understand 10%. We don't understand 20%. Where the 20% came from. <coughs> so the Gemara says, Bechol asher aser This was the Pasuk that Yaakov Avinu made a covenant with Hashem. Bechol asher titeli aser aserenu lach Whatever you're gonna give me, it should not, it uh, should be double, aser, 
a hacerlo. Double time. Twice the Torah says, hacer a hacerlo. The first 10%, the second 10%, that's the 20%. Fast forward in Berashat, hacer de hacer. Hacer de hacer et por de boazareja. 10% plus 10%. This is the pasuk that talks about 20% of your field. Whatever the yield of the field was for that season, the Torah encourages you to give 20%. And I'll tell you a secret. This is a guaranteed return investment. I'm not saying it only from the emuna perspective. I'm telling it to you now as somebody that is in the front lines that guaranteed that whenever the person gives ma'aser, that money comes back. And often <coughs> from the least expected sources. I'm sure that all of us have personal stories on this topic, uh, but we'll continue further. The Gemara writes, that even though is the concept of Maaser, another Takana, the Hachamim established in the time of the Sanhedrin. Now, I'm going to say something written 2,000 years ago. And probably for many generations, it did work accordingly. Today, because of who we are, as humans, the society that we live in, the influence that we get from all over, and the, 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 the freedom of speech that everyone has, things could be a bit different, although I believe that the lessons of the Torah are eternal. But I want you to listen to this Gemara. It says, Amar Bishak, in Usha Hakabim made a Takana, when it comes to educating your children, you speak to them in a pleasant way and in a soft fashion concerning Torah learning. Till when? Until the time that he turns 12. From now on, once he turns 12, you need to activate, and I'm giving you the mild version of the Talmud, disciplinary action for him to learn Torah. Now, anyone who listens to this statement of today's Talmud, they will say, Rabbi, I agree with your statement before. Today, if you use force to learn Torah, it will not go far. It says, if you want a message to be delivered, it needs to be delivered in a proper, loving, caring way. What Shalom Melech says, Lashon Raka. Tishbor Garem. Okay, what does it mean, Lashon Raka? A soft tongue. A soft tongue has the power to break down the mountain. That's what Shilomo Amelech says. And Shilomo Amelech was Hacham Mikol Adam. Shilomo Amelech, King Solomon, wasn't just a rabbi or it happened to be the king of Israel, the son of David Amelech. God gave wisdom to Shalom HaMelech. We all have some level of godly wisdom. But can you imagine that God makes a direct transfer of wisdom? And you have more knowledge than any human being and all human beings put together. And understanding, including understanding the language of the animals. When they talk and they make sounds. We don't understand really what that means, but just I'm giving you a free sample of the greatness of Shalomo HaMelech. And that's why Shalomo HaMelech, Hashir Hashirim, Mishle, Kohelet, 
all these powerful books that they carry a tremendous amount of eternal lessons. So the Gemara goes further and it says as follows. And it says that the concept of uh, Hinuch, the concept of education, Shilamo Amelech writes, Hanuch Lanar al pi darko. Al ki. Hanuch Lanar al pi darko. Gam, gam, lo al. Ah, I knew it. Okay. Gam ki askin. Mimenta. What does it mean? Educate a child on his way, his meaning in his level, in his type of personality. And we all we all have children, or we all have brothers, and we know that people have different personality. To someone, you need to tell them once, and they listen, and they say amen, and they do it. To another person, you're gonna say it twice or three times. To a third person, you have to explain. Ah, okay, correct. Each person has a different way of being. The Gemara writes that there are three basic differences. And we learned this not long ago in the essence of a person. The looks of their face, the sound of their voice, and the brain. And each person is molded to a different way. So it says that the Pasuk from Shilomo that even when this child will become older in life, will become mature, Girsa de Yankuta, it's called. Girsa de Yankuta means what a child learns. As a child, the la mishtakah doesn't become forgotten. How many times you hear people go up to the Sefer Torah? That's a simple example. Or a child who is invited to say the Shema. He reads the Beracha to the Sefer, excellent. He reads the Shema, beautiful. Take him out of the Beracha of the Sefer. Take him out of the Shema, cannot read. How come? Because that was a drill into the mind of the child. Your Bar Mitzvah is coming, you're going to say the Beracha, you're going to say it in public. You have to prepare the Shema for your Bar Mitzvah, etc. But what happened with the rest? The Gemara goes even further. The Gemara says, how young does the child need to be to start learning Torah? So the Gemara elsewhere says that the moment that the child is able to speak, Aviv Hayab Lamedo Torah. The father must start teaching Torah. <laughs> what is the first thing you teach the child? Torah Sivalano Moshe. The very famous Pasuk from Perashah Bezot Amerachah. And the reason why we begin with that Pasuk is because that Pasuk begins with the words to Torah. <laughs> so you're telling a child, <coughs> excuse me, Torah. It's your goal in life, as a Yehudi. Once the child has that, then you start saying, Odeani, and Berachot, and Netilat Yadayim, Kippah, Sisib, whatever misvot come across our life. And obviously, as the years go by, the person grows more and more and more in Torah knowledge, which is a blessing that we have today. Many generations back, the way the Torah was learned was that a father will teach their son. So what happened to a child that, God forbid, didn't have a father? <coughs> that child didn't learn Torah. Or what happened a child that his father was working all day, traveling, was hardly home, so who will sit with him? Until there was a great rabbi, Rabbi Yoshua ben Gemala or ben Gamla, and he established the concept of community funding, so to speak, that everybody would chip in a bit, and the parents of the teachers, of the students, will hire a melamer tinokot shelbet rabban, which is the concept of Talmud Torah. 
and to history, we had many different names. It was later were called Ketab, uh -huh. right? Hala. Hala, and now it's called Yeshim, <laughs> or day school, depends on the school. Kolel. Kolel is for married, yeah, Next no, slide. wait, you Next still, slide. we still are getting pregnant. You're already talking about Kolel. Stand up, show you. Stand Wait till the baby is born, then we talk about the Kolel. Maybe it's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, in a more serious note, Baruch Hashem, uh, even 50 years ago, that a child uh, 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 goes automatically to the Jewish school system, it wasn't guaranteed. How many people in the younger years, don't answer this question, I know the answer. How many people here present went to public school 50, 60 years ago? Okay? I think all of us. Many. We had yeshiva elementary and then public high school. Right. Okay, so you went to the basic elementary school to Jewish school, then you went to high school, public high school. Then we got Baruch Hashem, right. Baruch Hashem, right. thank God. Right. And afterwards you have the Ketab in the afternoon probably, right? Yeah. Hazal Baruch, Magen David 67th Street, right? Shadzion right. in the back. Shadzion in the back as well. In the building, beautiful. So I'm happy that everybody went through the system today. Today, to put a child in the public school system is sakanat nefashot. It's spiritually dangerous. Physically. I'm not talking the physical aspect of life yet, because some schools have gun detectors and metal detectors, so you can understand the type of the environment that they have. Some areas could be cleaner, some areas would be difficult and more challenging, but from a Torah perspective, we understand that the younger the child gets educated into the ways of our traditions, into the ways of our Torah mitzvot, to follow in the footsteps of our forefather will be unbelievable. I just met a rabbi earlier today that he works with an organization that in the last year, or two years, uh, they transfer 4,000 Jewish students from public schools to Jewish educational system. And this didn't happen in Cuba. This happened in New York. I don't know the name of the organization, so I don't want to say it. But unbelievable, do you know what it means? 4,000 neshamot you save? It's an unbelievable marriage. And I know of someone that he, for many years, supports students to do the transfer from the public school to the yeshiva system. How many students did this fellow sponsor? The maximum amount he sponsored was seven hundred students. Do the number. He must have hit the lotto. He didn't, he didn't need the lotto. He was very successful business-wise, and he made a promise to give most of his wealth throughout his life to save Jewish lives. Obviously, his family is taken care of wisely, the way we learned in the Gemara before, and the surplus he wants to give throughout his lifetime. I know another fellow that also very successful, and he was interviewed, I'm not gonna say the name, he was interviewed by the news, news media, and they said, we don't understand. When you fly, you fly coach. Why don't you fly first class? Why don't you fly private jet? says, why should I waste my time? Because I'm going to fly in business class, my seat is going to get earlier to the destination. <laughs> it's going to be the same destination. It's going to be the same hours of flight. It's going to be the same customs agents coming to an international country. So what difference does it make for me to fly coach or a fly first class? I know that that's a very humble 
person. I know the person personally for many, many years. And it's a person who also made a commitment to give most of his wealth throughout his lifetime for education, outreach, etc. Different wealthy individuals have different mindsets and goals in where their charity wants to go to. To some people, they like to help needy families, widows, orphans, brides, etc. Some people like outreach. I remember that many years ago, there was a competition in South America, I believe, uh, worldwide, okay? <clears throat> Who will come with the most innovative type of outreach program to cause the maximum impact for the Jewish people? And there are many wonderful programs out there. And I'm not going to mention any one in particular because it will not be fair that I will say one and not the other. And I already have in my brain 10 programs that worldwide they do great outreach work. You have to understand, in the Jewish world, there are two aspects, in-house outreach and outreach outside of the less affiliated or non-affiliated individuals of the Jewish nation. Some groups specialize in this type of outreach. Other groups, they do in-house outreach. And different group, groups utilize different tactics. Have you ever heard of the Kolel of Las Vegas? Yes. There is a Kolel in Las Vegas. Hmm. And you will say, hold on a minute. Las Vegas is always a place related to what? Casino. To casino, gambling. Don't go check it out. If you never went to Las Vegas, don't say, Rabbi, I want to go to the Kolel in Las Vegas. You come to the Kolel of the Safra Synagogue, you're okay. <laughs> but there, and I spoke to one of the rabbis there, and I asked him, how do you do it? He says, first of all, the Kolel in Las Vegas is not close to where the tourism is. There is a parallel growing Jewish community who lives there. Nothing to do with the, with the, with the, with the you know, it's like saying, oh, how can you live in South Beach? We don't live in South Beach. That South Beach is 200 blocks away. Okay, keep South Beach there. You understand? So we are able to live in Aventura even though we are part of the same county, but we have our boundaries, right? And we have our safe deposit box called the synagogue, called the yeshivot, called the kolelim, that keeps us connected. And to a certain extent, we create a blockade from the negative influences that a place like South Beach could <laughs> represent, perhaps. And God forbid I'm not bashing South Beach, but I'm only being realistic of what the mindset of people is in this matter. So they do a wonderful, wonderful program. And they tell me, Rabbi, you have no idea how many unaffiliated Yehudim out there. And they create beautiful, beautiful programs with one goal, outreach. How to save Neshamot. That's it. Like Lubavitch does, like a Torah does, number one to average, 50 years ago, not now. No, of course, not started 50 years ago, etc. And obviously, and I got forbid, you know, you said something, so I needed to say more, because then I'm going to get comments. Rabbi, how come you did not say this and this? Let, look at itorah.com. Let's give him a free shout out to itorah.com. itorah.com does Torah outreach via the internet. You have no idea how many people listen to itorah.com. I don't know numbers. And I'm not talking about this class. I'm talking about collective amount of hours and amount of minutes and lectures. You know, yesterday I spoke to one of the twin brother 
of itorah.com in Spanish. It's called Gamzum Letova. I am there in Gamzum Letova in the Spanish and English channel. If you Google my name, you'll see me there. Spanish is the forte. And they told me numbers of Torah lessons, of minutes, of visitors to listen to Torah words. Can you imagine four million visitors in the past two years? Beautiful. Probably I Torah is older, has many, many more. And how this program started has a fun activity due to COVID. Since people were home, especially in South America, that lockdown meant real lockdown hmm. for months, people literally were going crazy. <clears throat> Here also, how did we start the Zoom channel? And the Zoom in Yan, till today is going on. How many people we have daily that they are in different places? How many more Torah classes were given online. That's a great, a great zechut for Am Israel. <coughs> it's a great merit and blessing, and you'll be surprised how people are thirsty for Torah. And it's actually a sign of Mashiach's arrival. arrival. The Pasuk writes, Lo ra'avla lehem belo sama lamayim kim lishmoa et divrei Hashem, will come a time in history that people will not be starving for food and will not be thirsty for water, but they will have a desire to learn Torah, to listen to Torah more. I see it. I see it personally. I don't want to say the word daily because I will exaggerate, but I see it often. I see it often. Sometimes I give a class in Spanish at night. Starts our time, nine o'clock, which for Florida is unheard of. You're gonna start a class at nine o'clock at night, Rabbi. For many of us, nine o'clock at night is way past dinner and bedtime. Now imagine that nine o'clock Miami it's 11 o'clock or midnight Brazil, mm. or 4 a.m. Spain, and 10 p.m. other country. And you know how many people watch the class live? I'm not going to say the number so you don't become haughty and arrogant about it. I want to finish the class close to 11, 10 30, quarter to 11. They tell me, please keep talking. I'm not sure in America this concept will fly. <laughs> keep talking, okay? But for the Spanish crowd, and many of them are dealing still with curfews because of COVID and mandatory masks on the street, etc., the Torah learning is the oxygen for their neshama. And it's never too late because somebody says, Rabbi, you just told me education of the child when he turns three years old, six years old, 12 years old, I'm 49 years old. So is it too late for me? God forbid. Never. Never. It's never too late. Rabbi Akiva, the one and only, how old was he, right? 40 years old, 40 years old. Obviously, even if a person is 60 years old, it's not too, it's not too late. Okay, maybe the person will not go to school, will not go to the yeshiva system, but a person can learn Torah. Log in to itorah.com, and you listen, and you watch speakers, topics, lectures, live, you know, delay transmission, whatever it may be, but guaranteed, guaranteed that any person that learns Torah will receive 
spiritual benefits and blessings. Why? Because the Torah, it's called, the Gemara says it, Divre Elokim Hayim. Many times in the Gemara, we have an argument between two opinions. And we don't know who is right and who is not. And one time the Gemara says, Elu ve Elu, Divre Elokim Hayim. They're both right. They're both right. They both are delivering God's message. So Torah always delivers God's message. You want to learn about godliness? Torah. Very powerful Gemara of today, very practical as well. A few minutes of the Musar of today. We continue with Sha'are Kedusha. We're going to continue reinforcing yesterday's class. But today has to do with self-control in reacting verbally. Yesterday was the dangers of criticism, of picking on someone, of anger. Anger and being sensitive in a negative fashion. Says the Gemara in Hulim, in Aulam Mikta'yem, Ela Bemisha Bolem Pir Beshaat Meriva. The world stands in the merit of the person who Bolem Piv means seals their lips in the moment of an argument. Beeno Meshiv Lahem. You don't lower yourself to their level. Let's say a person says something to you inappropriate, something offensive, out of line. The world will say, say something. Don't be a chicken, right? You know what the Torah says? Stay quiet. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Maybe easier said than done, especially in the peaceful and calm setting that we have. Shene emar tole eres al belimar. Iyov says tole eres. The world is suspended. The world is hanging. Tole means to hang. Eres, the earth, al belimar. Yani, the zechut of the existence of the world is in the merit of those that don't answer back. So imagine yourself, you have a sign that says, breakfast sponsored by. In Shabbat, there is a sign that says, the existence of the world today, sponsored by Mr. XYZ, that in his argument at home, I make it easy. I'm not talking about the street. I'm not talking about road rage. I'm not talking about a, a, a business deal. I'm talking about a home. Something that could happen. Has the shalom. That could be arguments. She'a'olam omer al velimav piv. Rabbi Abu says further. Ena'olam mitkayem ela al mi she'mesim atzmo ke mi she'eno. Rabbi Abu says even more challenging. The world stands in the merit of the one that does not exist. So what does it mean that does not exist? It says somebody says something to you, you ignore, you move on. Don't enough, did not affect you. It's not so easy. But that's what it says. And it brings Pesukim. Those individuals that sometimes could be mistreated. And they don't answer back to the low level of the aggressor. We're talking about verbal. You keep your posture. You don't answer back. Pasuk from Shofetim that says, Be'ohavav, Keset HaShemesh, 
big Buddha to it says this is the love that Hashem has to them like the sun comes out with its powerful strength what is this connection between the sun rising and the lack of reaction so allow me to share with you the footnote and it says as follows that when a person does not react when you can react because somebody said something to you inappropriate out of line and you stay quiet to react doesn't take effort to react is automatic but if a person says you know what I'm not gonna react I'm not gonna expand the argument I'm gonna stop it right now that inner struggle that a person has it shows the strong foundation of a person connection with Hashem similar to the Sun rising the Sun and the moon are two opposites correct the moon functions when the Sun is out of sight once the Sun comes up the moon leaves no choice it's not like the moon leaves the moon is there but the power of the Sun is so powerful that it makes the moon invisible <clears throat> so it says be amal eliyahu nabi eliyahu nabi zahur letov says le'olam hevi alu libne adam belibne betecha yoter mikula is a heavy statement <clears throat> it says if with any interpersonal interaction we need to be cautious of not reacting the ultimate test is at home and I think that we all agree to that the Amar of Eliyahu Le'olam En ha-Torah mitpareshet Ela Bemi she'eno kafdan De Masechet Kala says Torah can become an habitual resident and understanding of the deeper essence of the Torah on those individuals which are not meticulous or sensitive in a negative way towards others. Be'af ani, Eliyahu Nabi says, Eni nigla ella lemi she'eno kafdan. You want to meet Eliyahu Nabi? We all want to meet Eliyahu Nabi, right? Maybe we already met him. I don't know that he's Eliyahu Nabi. Right? In the Berit Mila. But do you see Eliyahu Nabi in the Berit Mila? No. You sense him because you have the emuna and the beliefs of the Achamim. But it says, Eliyahu Nabi, it says, I reveal myself to only to those that are not sensitive in a negative way against others. Great is the merit of the person who recognizes their own limitations. And he remembers that one day will come that a person will have to meet the Creator. That the person knows that Hashem is always with him or her. And the person remembers that Hashem gave him life in order for the person to serve Hashem and to learn Torah. Being Ken who say, if this is how the person lives, a person understands that whatever blessing is from Hashem, the person understands that God is with us, the person takes advantage of time and learns Torah, the person acts in the proper way, especially to his family, friends, etc. Being Ken who say, if this is how he polishes himself. For sure, one second, for sure that Shamayim likes this person and people like this person because if I'm a nice person to you, what is there not to like about me? Nothing. Nothing. You don't know me. <laughs> you don't know me, that's why you said that. 
But let's clarify. I'm not talking about me as a person. Okay? Sometimes you say, I like this from this person. And I don't like this from this person. I don't like that from that person. Obviously, the more we concentrate on the positive and the less we concentrate in the negative, the better it is. And there are people that regretfully have this deficiency that they always look at matters with a certain negative eye. We learned this last week, how dangerous that is for the person, for the environment, and I don't mean the EPA environment. I mean, I mean the environment of the person's life. And the ultimate benefit, betamir Hashem Eimo. And God will always be with this person. Because the Mishnah in Birkei Avot says, how do you know if God likes you? Do you know if God likes you? He loves you. Hashem loves you for sure. But there are many different levels of love. How do you know that Hashem likes a certain person? Short answer from the Birkei Avot, what's happening on the planet Earth? If the person has a good name, has a good reputation, has a good level of friendship, and, 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 and good behavior. And let's clarify. Good behavior, I don't mean, God forbid, good behavior or criminal behavior. For the criminal behavior, we'll send you the sergeant. We'll talk to you, and that's it. See what I'm saying? I'm talking about behavior as a person. As a person. Are you kind? Are you patient? Are you tolerant? Are you sensitive? Are you a positive person? Are you a negative person? Are you a person that compliments or a person that complains and criticizes? All these words that I just put on the table is part of what the message of the Sha'ari Kedusha was today. You had a question? That's why I was told that, that not when you're embarrassed, if somebody embarrasses you and, you and you stop and you don't answer, it goes one step further. Stop and pray for what you're lacking and what you're Correct. Doing. We have heard that from many, many great holy rabbis that a person, exactly, I'm going to say it loud so the audience can listen, that a person that was uh, embarrassed or spoken in a negative way and the person at that moment exercise the self-control that Shaharek Edusha said, and the person does not answer back, at that moment, for this person, is called Ed Rasson. Whatever you pray for, you have guaranteed delivery. Why? Because you went against your nature. Your Teva, the nature of a human being, is to react. And by the way, to summarize this, I will finish because I have Spanish class in itorah.com para el público de habla hispana en itorah 10 y 45 para esa Hashem empieza la clase. To summarize this, to serve Hashem requires self-control and discipline. Otherwise, we will not be here. We have the discipline of getting up we have the discipline of Netilat Yadayim. We have the discipline of putting on Talet and Tefillin, of praying, praying with the Minyan, coming to learn. So discipline and self-control is part of who we are. But when it comes to the person themselves, that's when the Yeser Ara many times activates a bit of Shpilkes, so to speak, to cause the person to explode and, God forbid, escalate an argument. And we know well that arguments don't bring any blessing whatsoever. Even the person may feel, you know, I scream louder, I have the final word, but our overall content, mahloket or argument, don't bring any beracha. But self-control, you preserve peace, and if you preserve peace, you're wearing God's uniform. Because peace is one of the names of Akadosh Baruch Hu.
תזכה למזוות to the generous sponsors of the Lord, ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן, רבי חנניה בן הקשיא